Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us. I know some um, uh, late arrivals are still coming in, but uh, give us enough time to cover uh, the range of uh, important, we hope interesting topics we'd like to cover today. Let's, let's get started. Thrilled to see all of you here uh, for this week's Latham and Watkins Forum, uh, whose title is Government Lawyering in the Trump Administration. Uh, and we're going to talk about that, and we're really fortunate to have two distinguished scholars and residents here at NYU, two professors of practice, Ann Milgram and Preet Bharara. Um, we would need triple the amount of time allocated to the session if, if I were even going to attempt to recite for you their extremely impressive CVs. Uh, so I'm not going to attempt to do that. But in order for us to uh, achieve one of our goals for this session, which is, to be clear at the outset, really not to try and convince any of you of any particular point of view on how to think about government lawyering in the Trump administration or in any other administration for that matter. Uh, it's not to urge on you any particular view about the right answer to questions that might arise under that rubric, um, but we hope to suggest ways of thinking about the hard issues that could arise. Um, maybe frameworks for approaching the kinds of trade-offs that one might face at different points of one's career. And one way to start with that is to, is to note that there are certain kinds of questions that can arise for a government lawyer in any administration, or for that matter, for any lawyer in any professional context. And just to give some background of how we come to these things, I thought we'd start uh, with Anne and then with Preet um, reciting a bit of their own CVs to talk about uh, their government service uh, and the different contexts that that took place in um, and different points in time that it happened. So, Anne, welcome. Why don't we start with you? Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so I graduated from NYU School of Law, and after clerking for a federal judge in New Jersey, I went to the Manhattan DA's office. I spent three and a half years as a prosecutor, and I applied to and was accepted to the United States Department of Justice. I took that job and accepted that job the day before the Bush-Gore election. I will tell you, and you should not trust my political advice on these things because I also believe that Secretary Clinton would win, I was confident that uh, Al Gore would be the next president of the United States. As you all know, it turned out Al Gore was not the next president of the United States. And I had just accepted a job in the Civil Rights Division at the United States Department of Justice. Now, I was going to the criminal section, which as many of you know, um, since the 1950s has been on the forefront of prosecuting uh, police misconduct, um, correctional officer misconduct, hate crimes, and then most recently human trafficking after 2000. But I accepted my job, I actually began in January of 2001. And so I struggled in that very moment with I think a lot of the questions that we're gonna touch on today. Should I go into an administration, I was a registered Democrat, that was different than my political views? Would I be complicit in things I didn't agree with if I went in? Really, I also was worried about whether I could learn and have a meaningful career and do meaningful work. I wondered if it would be held against me if I joined the administration. I did join and I did go to work in the Civil Rights Division uh, in the criminal section where I worked for four and a half years as a lawyer in the Bush administration. I prosecuted police brutality cases, I prosecuted hate crimes, I prosecuted human trafficking cases. My work was largely very deeply supported and our work in the criminal section was very deeply supported by the administration. Now, I wouldn't tell you I think that that was the case for all the units in civil rights. That was the case in my unit. But I think it's important to put that piece in context. The only other job I want to talk about before I turn it over to Preet, because we'll come back, I think, to yeah. a lot of those themes, is that after being at DOJ, I traveled every week. Um, one day I woke up and I didn't know where I was. I was in Nashville, Tennessee, and I would, had been in Oklahoma City earlier in that week, and I thought, this is not a good life. <laughs> I need to get out of here. So I went briefly to the Hill, um, where I met uh, Mr. Barrara, and we worked together both for Democratic senators. And then I returned to New Jersey, where I became, which is my home state, I became the first assistant attorney general and then the attorney general. Under my time as attorney general, we prosecuted a large number of cases, including a number of political corruption cases. I can tell you without question that we prosecuted as many Democrats, if not more, as Republicans, and that the single most inappropriate calls I got as attorney general came from, Democrat, came from Democrats. 
and, and a piece of this, which I will tell you, is that they had been the party in power for a long time. They, they were the party um, of the state of New Jersey. They ran the legislature, they ran the governor's office. And so I want to encourage all of us not to be too absolute in our thinking, one side is good, one side is bad. I think that these are very complex and hard things to consider, and I'm looking forward to talking through how we all think about these decisions. Great. Preet? Um, <clears throat> it's great to be what here. What was your job before this again? I can't. <laughs> so, so I'm no longer a government lawyer in the Trump administration, <laughs> uh, for, for reasons that you may have heard. So, so, my, so my experience, in many ways, parallel, parallels Anne's. And as we think about these issues that are on the table today of you know, whether you join, uh, how you act when you're in the position of being a lawyer in a particular administration, whether you stay, what you say when you're doing the job and whether you leave, um, I think a lot of it depends on uh, what your position is, what the position of the administration is, and, and what, the, what the job entails. And so, like Anne, I had sort of three different jobs as a government lawyer, all, I think, with different considerations that relate to this question. So you know, I went to Columbia Law School and I was a, a lawyer in private practice for six years and then I began my government service for 17 and a half years. And my first job was as a line prosecutor, like Anne was a line, line prosecutor in um, the, Par the Department of Justice. And that is a particular kind of job where uh, you know, it really doesn't matter, in my view, as a criminal prosecutor in the Southern District of New York, who the president is. I, I started that job when, when Bill Clinton was still president uh, a few months before Ann joined the DOJ, George Bush became president. I don't, I, there was no way in which my job became different uh, in that position. Then, for a period of years where I met Ann in, on the Hill, I was the chief counsel to Senator Charles Schumer. That is a very different kind of government lawyer job and uh, implies very different things about whether or not you're pursuing another person's agenda or what you think your own conscience dictates. Uh, and it's, it's much, much, much more a job of promoting and being you know, loyal to the agenda of the particular member, because if you didn't want to work for that person, you work for someone else. And the question of how aligned should your views be, legal, ethical, political, uh, policy oriented, is a very different question when you're working for a, for a particular person, if that's the kind of job you're thinking about you know, going into in the government. And then my third job, was as a, as a political appointee and was the Attorney General of the State of New Jersey. I was the United States Attorney in the Southern District of New York, appointed by President Obama, confirmed by the Senate. And you're a much more public figure. I still think that job was different from a lot of other government jobs. Um, you know, the, the, as many of you may have heard, uh, the nickname for our office was the Sovereign District of New York. We care about independence. I think the law enforcement function, generally speaking, should be independent. We can talk about how the many ways in which that may be under fire these days. But the question of whether or not, uh, of what your responsibility is to your conscience, to the law, uh, versus the agenda of a particular president is presented differently if you are, I think, you know, working as the White House counsel to a president, or you know, the chief counselor to the EPA administrator, or the United States Attorney in the Southern District of New York. So you know, I hope we get into those issues, but yeah. the way I thought about it you know, ultimately was you know, I didn't serve a president. And I told my office the day after the election, because some people, you know, it's not a political place, but, but some people had a strong reaction to the election. And I, and I told them, you know, our job in this office, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, is not to serve any particular president. Uh, it's to serve the Constitution and the public. And those are different things. And we had that luxury, and that's how I thought about that. So I think a message that comes through from what what each of you has said is that uh, it's too general to talk about government lawyering in the abstract, um, but there are different kinds of jobs uh, with different sorts of expectations. So just um, spell that out a little bit more. So um, maybe everyone intuitively, or many people at least intuitively, would understand, OK, there's a difference between working for a particular senator, even if, if what your job is as their legal counsel, let's say, um, and working as Attorney General, um, or U.S. Attorney, or as a line prosecutor. So let's take the Attorney General, U.S. Attorney off the table for a moment. It's probably not where these folks are going to start their careers. They're, they'll undoubtedly all end up there. Just um, a couple of years. <laughs> um, uh, so on the one hand, you know, working for an elected official in a rel relatively direct way, and on the other hand, working, taking up a civil service job 
um, within some part of, let's say, the federal government. And we could take two just sort of organizing examples. Let's say one is in the Justice Department, and let's say another is in um, a place that's not filled with lawyers but contains some lawyers, EPA, let's say. Um, how would you think about those differently? What would you be thinking about what the sort of starting assumptions are if one goes to work for a particular senator versus taking a job as a line prosecutor versus taking, let's say, a legal policy job in a, in a part of the government like EPA? I mean, I, I think when you take a job, and, and both Preet and I did this, when you take a job for an elected official, you are selecting someone with whom your values align as a rule. You are making a decision that you're going to work for someone who's been elected to office on a platform. And candidly, you're never going to agree, or you're never going to agree with anyone on 100%, but someone whose work and whose values you support. Now, I cannot, maybe I shouldn't say this with press here, but I will say it. There were plenty of times where John Corzine would scream from his office that was like the end of this room to my office because he disagreed with me and he would want me in his office to tell me that we were thinking about something in different ways, right? Senator Schumer would scream at me to my face. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was right there. I'm, I'm right here. So we have, slightly, have scream. we have similar but slightly different, different experiences, but you are going to disagree. And I think lawyers represent clients, and one of the things I think is really important to understand is that there is no job in the world where you will agree 100% with your boss. And candidly, when I hire people, I always look for people who will be open and honest with me about things with which they disagree, but for whom, if we make a decision together, and if I'm the boss, I make the ultimate decision, everyone moves to implement it as though it were their decision, right? And that is a really important thing in my view about you want people to disagree, but you also, you join institutions and you join teams with an understanding that, you know, if you work for an elected official, at the end of the day, Senator Corzine decides what is the policy on nuclear arms, right? He gets to decide what is the, you know, will he vote for John Roberts, will he not vote for John Roberts? So I think it's really important in the political space to delineate that. Do you want to take the DOJ piece? Yeah, uh, just, <clears throat> just to uh, affirm what you're saying, and it extends to a lot of other things, too. I think at the level we're talking about, <clears throat> entry level in a, con in a congressional lawyer position or in the Department of Justice or the EPA, what matters a lot more, probably, than what the administration policy is or who the president is, is your own personal constitution and whether a certain kind of work suits you. Um, there are lots and lots of people who in their careers have been both criminal defense lawyers mm -hmm. and prosecutors. I would say that's a, a pretty large group. I was, you know, I did criminal defense work. I became a prosecutor. Maybe one day I'll do that again, and a lot of people do that. But there are also people who uh, don't necessarily begrudge someone else becoming a prosecutor, but it's not their cup of tea. They don't want to do it because it, that's, not the, that's not the way they want to spend their time, and that's perfectly fine. And there are also people on the other end of the spectrum who have no interest, even though it's important part of the justice system and I respect them and I used to do it, who have no interest in representing people who have killed other people and have, and have you know, engaged in criminal activity. And that has nothing to do with who <coughs> the president is. It has a lot to do with what your own sort of personality is and what you can live with and what you can stomach. In a sense, though, that for, for, for anyone in any of those categories you mentioned, some of the answers that could follow for what jobs to pursue and not, um, might be easier, the, the, the answers to the questions might be easier than, um, than in other circumstances, right? So if, it, if you take that position, you know, I can't imagine ever being a prosecutor, well then the administration <laughs> is, is not, the, not the deciding factor. I can't have, imagine ever being a criminal defense lawyer, well then it doesn't matter very much the particular context in which one might be doing that. But if we assume, not to say that this describes everyone here, but I suspect it d describes some chunk of our students here. This is certainly a school that is, has a deep institutional commitment to the public good and to public service. So assume someone who thinks, I value public service. Um, I would like to see a part of my career spent as a government lawyer. How should I think about the variabilities of politics? Um, and how should I think about a difference between maybe a sort of range of ordinary <laughs> political difference and more extraordinary times? How, when should 
that affect my thinking? What, and so we've, Anne's given us one way of thinking about it. If the job I'm thinking of taking up in public service is working for a particular senator, you'd expect a fair degree of alignment with political position there. But what about in a larger institution like, like the Justice Department? <clears throat> it sort of depends on the thing you want to do. So for example, um, when you're deciding that you want to pursue a certain kind of work, let's say a certain kind of civil rights work, and you care about uh, immigration, and you care about the fate of, uh, of undocumented people in this country, and that's where you want to pursue the first few years of your legal career, I think it's fair, even at a line level, to think, well, I could go into the government, uh, or what are my other options? And it's probably safe to say, I don't think this is controversial to this group, that maybe today, unlike the decision to go become a line prosecutor and, and do uh, you know, public safety work, that in the area of, of, of that kind of immigration policy and legal work, maybe your time is better spent, arguably, working for a public interest organization, not the government, given the kinds of policies that are being uh, put forth. Uh, it's one caveat to what I was saying before about largely it being the case, like in the US Attorney's Office, that the, the policies and priorities of administration don't matter. That is largely true, and it's mostly true in the criminal side. There are places where it does change. Um, you know, every Department of Justice employee knows that there's a civil side, and every US Attorney's Office has a civil side that's not about prosecuting people, that again, I don't think is political, but sometimes has to represent the interests of the government, right? You're doing civil work, and when people sue the government, or uh, like they might have after the travel ban, those arguments in favor of what the president did in an executive order have to be defended by government lawyers. Sometimes those government lawyers are at the Department of Justice. Sometimes those government lawyers are in the US Attorney's Office. And, and those are areas where, in different circumstances, in a different administration, it might be easier for some of you to say, I want to go do that, and harder today. And I think that's the exception to the, to the point I was making about it not mattering. Can I, can I jump in on a couple pieces yeah. here? I mean, the first is, this is very much a conversation about being in the administration, but I do want to remind everyone that there are extraordinary government lawyer jobs that are not in the federal government. We had three great state AGs yesterday who were here, Schneiderman, Frosch, Madigan, were all here talking about their environmental enforcement work. Across the country, I think state AGs offices are doing some extraordinary lawyering. Um, there are city offices where there are lawyers, corporation councils, Zach Carter's terrific. So there are opportunities, and I know that's not the conversation for today, but I, I think it's important. It's an important point. It's Public an, service is yes. not something, the federal government has the monopoly. Yes, on. and yeah. we tend to be pretty federally focused, candidly, I think, because for a lot of reasons, they're amazing jobs, they pay a lot better. Um, you know, I thought it was a lot easier. Not no many people go into public service for the pay. It's true, it's true. <laughs> but I will say this, it was a lot easier to be a federal prosecutor than a state and local prosecutor. Good yeah. health care. Better health care. <laughs> but, but, you know, so there are a lot of reasons. But I, I don't want us to forget that piece of the conversation. The second piece is that I do think that there are important questions you have to ask yourself. Number one, it, is, it, is, it could be specific to the institutions you're looking at. So if you're looking at the EPA, you may be asking questions about whether the administration respects those institutions, whether they respect the rule of law. Those are core questions, and those are core values that I think are really fair to ask yourself if you're thinking about giving three years of your work there. I'm not telling you there's an answer to come up with, but I think there are differences oftentimes between places like the EPA and maybe the Army, right? I have a good friend who's just nominated to be the GC of the Army. I could not be happier that he is willing to go in and serve. I can't think of anyone who would be better to be in that job. And keep in mind that four years is a long time. We don't have the opportunity to opt out of being citizens of the United States of America for four years. And so a lot of this is about how do we engage and where do we engage. So one, I think, is value for the institutions, respect for the institutions. Another is rule of law. I also think enforcement priorities are worth considering, whether you're aligned with enforcement priorities. But on that, I don't want to tell you that I don't think that there's something happening that's more extreme than we've seen. But having been around for a long time, I can tell you that before there was this Sessions memo about how we should prosecute cases, there was a Holder memo. And before the Holder memo, there was an Ashcroft memo. And before that, there was another memo. So a good friend of mine calls this the Star Wars 
right? Call, calls it the Star Wars trilogy. There's Star Wars, then there's the Empire Strikes Back, then there's the Return of the Jedi. So <laughs> there's Star Trek big. But these these things do go in arcs, and I'm not telling you that this is not a more significant arc. I think it is, and I think it is distinct from what we've seen before. But some of it is actually not as different, having seen enough administrations now. There are pieces that are similar to what we've seen. Mm -hmm. can, can I just make it at the, at the risk of a utilitarian career-oriented point uh, for students? Um, as Anne says, uh, you know, four years is a long time, but administrations change. Mm -hmm. And one, I happen to think, so long as you, can, you have the Constitution for it, that there is no better way to prepare yourself to be an excellent advocate or a policy-oriented lawyer than many, many places in government, including the Department of Justice, a lot of agencies, U.S. Attorney's Office. I think it's a phenomenal experience. And if you are going to decide that for whatever reason, for temporal reasons, uh, to deprive yourself of the opportunity to learn and grow and develop your craft, I think, I think that's a shame, potentially. And then second, at the level that we're talking about, which I think is mostly devoid of politics, you develop skill, you develop a reputation for being excellent, and then they will become an opportunity later when maybe you're more aligned and you're higher up so it matters more because policy matters more, where you're in a position, personally, as a, as a growing and developing um, and you know, somewhat ambitious public interest lawyer, to, to get one of those jobs, one of those supervisory jobs. And if you, if you avoid that service now, just as a purely utilitarian matter, you are less likely then, at the time when you're more comfortable serving in a yeah. higher position, you're less likely to get that job. So right. just think about that also. Yeah. So s something running through what both of you have said here, I think, are, are kind of questions that someone could ask themselves on two different levels. One is um, my relationship to the policies of the administration writ large. What's the, uh, what is the, uh, any particular administration sort of respect for certain institutions within government or traditions within government, whether they fall under the rubric of the rule of law or otherwise? What do I think about those and is, is there some sort of level of discomfort mm -hmm. without regard to whether I am immediately personally implicated in those, a level of discomfort in being in government um, given the particular administration's posture? Uh, to those sorts of questions. And, and then the other level that I think you've talked about is, well, what am I going to be asked to do? What's, what's my job? What's my job responsibility? And might there be circumstances where I could be asked to do things that somehow would um, make me feel so uncomfortable or be so against what I believe in um, that I wouldn't want to be serving in those circumstances? And those feel to me like both relevant kinds of questions but quite different. Um, and maybe they merge in some circumstances. Maybe. Um, a government lawyer called upon to defend a particular policy of that government might be a circumstance where the two merge a little bit. But if we just pull them apart for a moment at least, um, on the latter, what might I be asked to do? Um, and might I be asked to defend a position that I don't ultimately prefer as a policy matter? Is that categorically different from the sort of dilemma that a lawyer might face in any context, right? You could go to a private firm and end up representing, and anyone in private practice will run into this at least once, if not all the time, where they're defending clients uh, whose activities are not all in perfect alignment with the value set of the, of the personal lawyer. And so is, is, is this government lawyer dilemma just a version of that, or is there something different about about the challenge for a government lawyer. Can I give you a slightly humorous version and then a real serious version, um, which is that in my first job in the Manhattan DA's office, and they literally just, Cy Vance just announced that he will not prosecute these cases anymore, but my first cases were uh, token sucking cases. Do you guys, you're all too young to remember when New York City had tokens? And people would go up and they would put the token in the um, turnstile. And if the token, if you didn't push through the turnstile and it didn't fall down, the token sort of stayed there. And people would come up and suck the tokens out. Some people use straws, which I preferred. A lot of people didn't use you straws. You preferred using straws? I preferred them <laughs> using straws. <laughs> I preferred them using straws. But I always sort of felt like, 
you know, if you're going to suck the token, you can have the token. If you need, like, I, I just, I didn't feel great about it, right? And, and you know, you put I, in the work. like, yeah, I don't know. There was something about it that, like, it didn't feel, it didn't feel great. It also, candidly, felt a little bit like we were the collection agency for the MTA, right? Which is like, why am I the MTA collection agency? But I had, you know, I'd taken an oath to uphold the law. Those were cases that came through, and I did those cases. So that's a slightly silly version of it. I think the more serious version was when I was at the Department of Justice when there were death penalty cases that were brought in the civil rights criminal, um, in the, the criminal section of the Civil Rights Division. There was a, a police officer who had, um, had hired someone to engage in a murder in New Orleans um, who killed a, a witness in a case, and that was brought as a capital case. And there were a lot of conversations around the department about whether or not people would feel comfortable or not engaging in a death penalty case. And so I don't think that's a Republican or Democratic mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm. I think those are core questions about, and there were lawyers who said, I would resign before I would do a capital case. Um, so I think that these are, in some ways, part of the tough work of being a lawyer and deciding where the line is beyond which you, should, you would resign or you would not feel comfortable doing something. And I do think that those lines exist and we all of us have to know what our lines are. And how did you are. think about that issue, the capital case? The capital case, that would be a particularly long story, but I will give okay. you the short version of it, which is that my feeling when I was in the DA's office was that I could enforce any of the laws. Um, I also candidly knew that Mr. Morgenthau had a committee that had never voted for the death penalty. So I don't think it was a real issue for me because I knew it was never going to be an eventuality. At the Department of Justice, I prosecuted a case. We did not um, actually go forward, but I investigated a case against a woman named Joyce Gilchrist, who had been a forensic chemist in Oklahoma City, where she uh, was falsifying, was alleged to have falsified the precursor to DNA for many, many years in the Oklahoma City Police Department. Um, there was a man uh, who was convicted and served 18 years for a rape he didn't commit. We looked at hundreds of cases, many of which were death cases, and we could not answer the question of whether or not some of the people were actually innocent. Hmm. From that moment forward, I had personally very much believed that I would be uncomfortable prosecuting a capital case, um, given what I saw in that case, but I've never been in a position where I've had to mm -hmm. enforce it. But I, I certainly have struggled with it and thought about it. Mm -hmm. Look, <clears throat> I, think, I think you can distinguish, I think you need to know when you go to an institution if you're comfortable or not with some of the things that that institution does, and then also know if they're going to allow you to absent yourself from certain kinds of work. We were talking at lunch yeah. before this. There are some people who will not, and it's, I think, fair, because it's, it's all personal preference, and you have choice. It's a free country. If you're going to go to a law firm, and this used to be the case some years ago, less so now, there were people you know, that I knew in law school who said, I will not go to a law firm that has a substantial tobacco practice, you know, representing big tobacco. And then there are other people who said, I can go to such a firm, but I would refuse to work on such a case. And for the most part, firms, I think, would accommodate that. In the same way, like Ann is talking about, I'll tell you what the policy was in our office. During the seven and a half years that I was a U.S. attorney, I, we actually never pursued the death penalty in any case. None seemed worthy, and that could change in the future. And it, there were a couple of cases before I became the U.S. attorney. But the policy in the office was, if you didn't believe that you could, uh, in good conscience, argue for the death penalty, we actually had assistant U.S. attorneys who argued, because in the federal system you have two phases. You have the guilt phase, and if they find guilty, then you have a penalty phase. And literally, we would have sometimes, didn't happen very often, assistant U.S. attorneys who would argue guilt, get the conviction, and then, and then they would step back, even though they poured their heart and soul into the guilt phase and believing this person, this terrorist has happened, for example, in the case against a number of individuals who bombed the, the American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, and didn't argue for the death penalty. And if you're personally comfortable in engaging in things that, that fit with your worldview, your policy and ethical view, and it's okay for other people to do that, then that's a place you can go. It, it's a little bit the question of whether or not you think that you're not comfortable defending something versus whether you think that something is utterly indefensible. Hmm. And, and, if, and if that's the case, then you probably don't want to join that institution. That seems like an important yep. organizing principle between whether you want to be part of advancing a particular argument and whether you think the argument itself or that species of argument is sort of totally out of bounds. And maybe another uh, way that that could arise, I, I think most of the kinds of cases we've had in mind and we've referred to 
so far are places where if there's a disagreement between one's own position and where the administration is on something, we could call it a disagreement at the level of policy. Um, that is, there's some, maybe it's a, a, a way of setting priorities in, in a prosecutor's office, maybe it's a, a policy in the immigration space that will be implemented through an executive order or otherwise, but the disagreement, um, there may be legal arguments against that policy, but the disagreement maybe is felt most strongly on the view that, that that's just not a policy that I support. And we've talked about how those can be hard questions about whether to be involved and in what ways in any of that. But are there clear cases? Is there a way, if we, we know there are lots of hard cases, are there easy cases? Um, for example, suppose you're in a circumstance where what you were being asked to do, you thought was actually illegal. Now just to raise it is to suggest hopefully that's an easier case, right? Um, yeah. Can you give us a, a little more context there? What would that look like? It never happened to me. So, uh, <laughs> good? <I'll think. laughs> yeah. Does that happen to you? Oh, it's happened, yeah. It's Where someone asked you to do something that you thought was actually illegal as opposed to disagreement over policy? It, yes, but I would say. What's I mean, their name? Uh, so. <laughs> Preet, you don't have that job well, anymore. Yeah, I know. Preet, this is, this is not stay tuned. <laughs> But I, my first day as AG, I got a call from a very prominent elected official in the state of New Jersey who said in a very smart way, people have told me that, and I was the first assistant and I oversaw the criminal division, we had a statewide prosecution office, people have told me that you were prosecuting X individual, insert name of state legislator, but I have told them that you are way too smart to do that. Did that person's name rhyme with I'm not, no, Smenetic. don't even, <laughs> we're not even, I swear we're not, but, but I will tell you that I, and, and, I, and I have to say this. It's really, <laughs> there, there are also benefits <laughs> to not being a government lawyer anymore. It's true, I know. You can say things. It's true, um, but I will not name names. But, but the, the, you know, I worked under Mr. Morgenthau. Mr. Morgenthau, remember, was fired as U.S. attorney. So he was the U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of New York. He was fired. I and thought he, I was the first. Person. No, I'm sorry. You were, you were, you and earned very good company. So Mr. Morgenthau, this, this is an idea, pre. Mr. Morgenthau decided, well, I'll run for Manhattan DA because then I can never be fired again, right? I will be the boss by, everyone. by the people, <laughs> but I can never have a political boss above me who changes policy, right? The people can change policy, but not, not me. Mr. Morgenthau blocked politics completely in the, in the DA's office. I never saw or smelled politics once. I now understand how extraordinary that was. I viewed that as my job as AG to block politics for all the lawyers in the office. But so keep in mind, I get this call. I have literally never had a call like this. I didn't know calls like this existed in the world. By the way, they do. <laughs> there are apparently a lot of them. And I was shaking. I was so angry. And all I could say is this is the most inappropriate phone call I have ever received and hang up. Right? And that was all I could do. I later had a lot of great comebacks. I really was, I was awesome like five days later, I was like, I should have said this. But of course I didn't resign because it wasn't, it wasn't one of those situations where my boss was telling me to do something, but I had, it was a wildly inappropriate Look, call. Look, you know, I, some may know this, you know, I got, I was asked to resign 20 hours after I received a phone call from President Trump that after some deliberation, and he left, left a message, and I, I engaged in some deliberation with my deputy, uh, and I chose not to return the call. Um, I don't know if it's connected to my going or not, but that it was a fairly extraordinary thing not to return the call of the president. But it's precisely to prevent myself from being in this position. And I presume- And he was your boss, which is a little different. I serve yeah. at the pleasure of that person yeah. as opposed to this person that you're describing who was in a different What would you government. have done if he said, I want to talk to you about this investigation? Well, so, I mean, I would have, I would have, um, it wouldn't have taken me five days to think of things to say back, I don't think. I know, you're better, you're better. I would have, no, you're, I would have, wow. you're far funnier, you know, no, it's true. Zing! <laughs> no, that's not what I, I took an hour, I really, I took an hour, and by the way, I talk about this in my in your podcast. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Did we say there's gonna be a certain amount of advertising? I, I, I can't believe it's taken this long. I waited an appropriate amount of time <laughs> before it's available at applepodcast.com. <laughs> Slash pre. Anyway, so I talk about this at much greater length. Um, no, I took the hour. I didn't decide immediately not to return the call, but I took the hour. And what I meant to say 
with respect to Ann, is, is I, we, we spent the hour thinking about if I returned the call and if it was, if something inappropriate was said, what would I say in response? So we were coming up with retorts in advance as opposed to getting an unexpected call. And also considered what would I do and how would it look if nothing untoward was said. And we ultimately decided that there was really no good way that this could look in the future, particularly given some of the prior events. And by the way, you know, since then, um, I'm more, more proud of and happy with my decision because we have examples that I credit and I believe of you know, the President of the United States sitting alone with Jim Comey, asking him to drop the case against Michael Flynn. The President of the United States, according to reports, which I also credit absolutely, telling the Attorney General, is there something you could do to drop the case against Joe Arpaio um, so you wouldn't have to exercise the, the pardon power later? But at some point, that was going to happen with me. And, you know, the, the, the question is a difficult one. We were talking about this earlier. Jim Comey experienced that same issue, right, as I just mentioned. He was told, according to Jim, uh, drop the case against Flynn. Should he have resigned? And some people have said, should he, have he should have maybe resigned at that moment, which is precisely the kind of situation we're talking about. Or, and I think it's arguable both ways, or if you say to yourself, that's inappropriate, uh, since my will is not going to be overborne, I'm not going to listen to it, I'm going to say, you know, forget about it, and I'm going to conduct myself in the way I always you know, thought I should, I'm going to stay. That's an interesting question. I mean, obviously, it, gets, it got resolved in favor of his being fired, but it's an interesting question. So that's um, good. I'm glad we're on the same page that uh, if anyone, without regard to administration or public service, private service, you know, asks a lawyer to do something illegal, that that's, the answers follow fairly clearly from, the, from that. But, no, but the question is also then, and you know, I have a particular view on this, when that, when that thing is asked of you, do you resign? Or do you say, I'm going to do my job and I'm going to do it, and yeah. if you don't like it, you can fire me, which is basically what Sally Yates did. Yeah. It's basically what Jim Comey did, which, which I think was correct. I mean, I'm, I'm partial to being fired myself. <laughs> but, 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 there, but, there is, but there is a reasonable ethical argument that, that, that that's not the right way to do it, and I think these are complicated questions. But the right thing to do when you believe, when, when Sally, who's a good friend of mine, uh, decided that she was going to issue that guidance to everyone saying don't enforce the travel ban, that the, that the better thing to have done, I, I'm on her side, but it's, it's not crazy the other side, the better thing to have done was to walk into the, uh, to the Oval Office and say, Mr. President, I don't think we can enforce this travel ban, and I don't plan to enforce it. And if you have a problem with that, then here's my resignation. Great. So that, and that brings out a kind of case that I wanted us to focus on, which is maybe somewhere between the two that we, we talked about so far, which is not that because I don't think that um, Sally Yates was being asked had she stayed and, and provided the, the, the guidance with respect to enforcement of the travel ban. It's, I, I don't think many people would suggest, I don't think she would suggest that she herself would have been violating the law. She would have been providing guidance um, that uh, assumed the legality of an executive order um, that was contrary to her conclusion. She thought, so this was providing a legal defense, in effect, for something that seemed to her to be not defensible I, legally. I don't even think she said that. I, it, so it makes the question even slightly more complicated. Mm -hmm. I don't think she said it's indefensible. I think she said, I'm not yet convinced that it is defensible. <laughs> right. So right. we can have a, and, and lots of folks in places like the Office of Legal Counsel and others debate over what exactly is the right standard there, and is it uh, any plausible defense, et cetera, and maybe that's where this conversation goes. But just to play that out. So lawyers not being asked to violate the law, like abandon or undertake a case for some clearly illegal reason. Um, it's also not just a matter, though, of kind of policy disagreement mm -hmm. with the position. Um, you, you, there's a position that the government is taking. You're a government attorney. Um, you're connected to that position in some way because it's going to be your job, unless you refuse to do it, um, to defend that position legally. Uh, and you have serious doubts about whether that's the correct position. So is that, what kind of dilemma is that? And what's the relationship between that kind of dilemma and someone in private practice who says my client needs a defense, but I'm not sure this is the best possible argument? Or a criminal defense lawyer who says my client needs a defense, um, but I'm not sure we're gonna win this thing in front of the judge. I think we might have the less good argument on the doctrine. What's, is it a different dilemma for a government lawyer? What is it? 
I mean, I think it goes back to the same framework, and you could sit in different seats when you have this problem. You could be a government lawyer, a private practice lawyer, or candidly an in-house general counsel. I mean, there are lots of different ways. Right, I, yeah, I think you could feel this, yeah. right? And I think these things are not as uncommon as we think, sure. right? There, there are moments of conflict or, or concern. I want to suggest, in fact, the, the premise of my question is this kind of dilemma, if it's a dilemma, arises all the time. I agree. I agree. Where lawyers are in a position of making arguments that I guess they need to think are professionally permissible, but maybe not ones that they think are yep. ultimately right. Right. Because the client insists. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I had one client who used to always want to make arguments that we knew would lose, right? And then you. That's different. From it's, I agree it's different, but there are times where you're like, well, I got to tell you, we're going to lose. Okay. Right. And what, what are the implications of losing? But, but I do think one of the, the things is how you think about these moments and what process you personally follow, Good, okay. which is this question of, you know, this first group of things, is it illegal? Does it some way violate an ethical canon, right? Or one of my responsibilities as a lawyer? I think that those are absolute mm -hmm. in my mind. Those are the things for which you don't do what you're asked to do or you offer your resignation. Then there's this bucket, which is you don't agree with it. You think that there are legal issues behind it. Um, and I think one question is, you know, can people reasonably see the law differently? Mm -hmm. Because we do, right? We have a Supreme Court because we all fight about what the law means and mm -hmm. how it gets interpreted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the dean is more of a constitutional scholar than me. I won't put Freed I mean, I in I that mean. bucket. But this is what we do in the law. And so what is a legitimate disagreement and what is not? For me personally, and I'll just <laughs> offer you one thought, I mean, there are people who I, when I have these moments, I do step back. I don't let myself be pushed into a quick decision. Pre Preet is a faster <coughs> thinker than I am. But there are people I call, people like Preet, people like Lisa Monaco, people who I trust completely. All at NYU. All at NYU, mostly it seems that way. <laughs> no coincidence. <laughs> but there are people who I will gut check and say, here's what I think, what's the other, and I always try to think the other side, hmm. too, of right, like, is this a legitimate argument? Is this a legitimate goal? And a lot of times the answer is yes, and I should get on, get on the bus and move, but I always do want to be heard, mm -hmm. right? And to me, I would suggest this to you, that if I were in a job, and I don't know that you will feel this way as a sort of really new lawyer, but if I were in a job where I was never heard, and the decision was always something with which I thought was legally wrong, it, forget the morally wrong, but just you don't have a voice, I would find it really hard. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be the right place for me. It doesn't mean that there would be anything eth unethical or illegal about it. It would just be really hard for me personally. Can I make one other point on this, <clears throat> the, yeah. the, the dilemma that the dean mentioned? It, it can be Trevor. It doesn't need to be the I dean. I know, but you know. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it is true, as we've been discussing, that these kinds of dilemmas arise no matter what kind of lawyer you are. They arise if you're a criminal defense lawyer. They arise if you are a general counsel. Um, you know what the right thing to do is, and you represent your client's interests. I do happen to think, however, uh, that, that why being a government lawyer and in public service for the government is different mm. and better and special is because I think that your responsibility is greater. Now that doesn't mean that from time to time, if you are a civil lawyer for the Department of Justice and some agency like DHS wants you to defend something that they do and you don't love it, you're representing a client. But I think the relationship between a government lawyer and his, and his or her client is different. And I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, we had a civil division where uh, you know, we had to defend bad things happen. You know, when, when bad things happen to people, including uh, malpractice suits at a, at a VA hospital, for example, um, my view was that my government lawyers were not supposed to be like hotshot defense lawyers who represent a big tobacco or some other company to do everything they can to avoid paying money and everything they, they could to get a great deal for the client. A my view was, and I, th I think the ethic permeated the, our civil division, hopefully every other civil division in the country, was if a bad thing was done and someone lost and suffered, the result should be something that was fair and equitable. That did not mean that the plaintiff who suffered some damage or harm should be able to take us to the cleaners just because we're the government and have a huge, you know, the biggest deep pocket in the world. <coughs> but it's not, it's not the same as being, a, as being a, a, a private defense yeah. lawyer of, of, a, of a doctor, you know, we wanted to make sure there was fair compensation. And so if, if, if there was an insistence that we unfairly deny any compensation, and this happens from time to time, any compensation to someone where there was, there was clear malpractice because we had some you know, legal loophole basis to do it, we wouldn't do that. 
I think this gets to the heart of this complete conversation, which is it is different to be a government lawyer. You represent the government. So yes, you work for a boss, you represent, you work for the head of the EPA, for the Attorney General, but ultimately you work for an institution in which you believe and in the rule of law for which you believe. And I think that captures some of the struggle that I think some students who I've spoken with have, which is, do I believe in this government? And in, is this administration the same as this government, right? Mm. And, and where's that? Where is it that, yes, I believe in government, I believe government can help people, government has a responsibility to prosecute laws that are violated, what does it mean here and now? Because um, I do think you're completely right. And it's one reason why I think we spent our careers in government until yeah, we came to because NYU. Because mostly, mostly, if you're in the right job and you're doing it properly, you get up every morning very, very, very comfortable with what you said in court and in papers and what your decisions have been and that's you know that's why I loved it. That's why I stayed yeah. until you know they kicked me out. And by the way, Trevor's never asked me to do anything illegal or inappropriate. <laughs> I just want to say it's one of the reasons. I wanted why to I figure out what your here. answer was going to be first, and then we'd go. <laughs> no, no. Um, Look, but I'm glad I'm glad you brought that out. I mean, this is you know you, one hears uh, people with government lawyer experience say this sort of thing all the time. It's important not sure. to lose sight of, and as Anne says, what makes these questions right now hard for the people for whom they're hard, and that's not necessarily everyone, um, is this question of what's the relationship between the notion of my serving the country, quite mm -hmm. literally, the yeah. country ultimately in some way being the client. Um, what's that, the relationship between that and the particular posture of a given administration yeah. if, uh, if its pursuit of what it thinks is in the national interest is really at odds with, with what I think is. And it must be the case that a change in administration doesn't mean and shouldn't mean a kind of moment for ideological purification of the civil service, right, of the, of the ranks of yeah. government lawyers. That would be horrendous. But there must also be a space for personal choice yeah. um, in terms of what you're asked to do and whether you're comfortable doing. But maybe even, and this is my last question before we open it up for a few questions um, from the audience, maybe even apart from what you're asked to do, would there be moments where, let's say you're not a political appointee, because maybe that's a special category. Again, you're a line attorney somewhere in the government. Um, and it's not because of what you're being asked to do, but it's because of actions taken by the government. Might, could there be a moment where you would think, um, I can't stay? And what would be the nature of the decision you'd make? And I can toss out, I mean, suppose, suppose this president, um, undertook to fire the special prosecutor, undertook to fire Bob Mueller, um, either attempted to do it directly or in a kind of Saturday night massacre, uh, you know, started ordering people to do it um, and kept going until he found someone who would do it. There, there's two kinds of, you know, broadly speaking, two kinds of resignations, right? And they can serve one or both purposes, the way I'm thinking about it off the top of my head. One is the way you frame the question, you resign because I can no longer do this thing, I'm not comfortable, it doesn't comport with my understanding of the law or my conscience or whatever else. Even if you're not having to do any part of it. He hasn't come to no, you no, and no, say no, fire right, Mueller. No, no, yeah. I'm, I'm saying okay. that's, that's one kind. Okay, okay. Yep. The, the hypotheticals we're talking about before. Yep. Yep. What you're talking about is the second kind, which is there's value in resigning in protest and making a statement and, use, and that has voice also. And there are some things that I think are worthwhile in the course of human events over which you resign because you say this is enough. Now, I don't know if this is one of those things, we'll see, but you know, a friend of mine, I don't know if, he's a, if you know him as well, Chuck Rosenberg, yeah. who's the acting head of the DEA, who was the United States Attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia, I think in the District of Texas, was Chief of Staff to Jim Comey, and again, I don't know this, but it has been reported in a couple of places that he tendered his resignation this week because he, and someone quoted someone who spoke to him as saying, he doesn't believe that the President has enough respect for the rule of law. That's interesting, and it'll be, you know, I'll be curious to hear what, if anything, he has to say about that going forward. But that's a high-level, you know, incredibly important, responsible position where someone is stepping down and may have been doing it for a particular reason, like you described. So, and that's, at once these students all find themselves as the head of the DEA, that'll be <laughs> yeah. one kind of dilemma. Um, but, so the first job I had in the Justice Department was a Bristow Fellow. Right, um, a not yet admitted attorney, um, the most junior lawyer in the office, 
And so suppose these students are Bristow fellows, right? They're in the office of the Solicitor General. Um, they're in an administration that takes a position or the president takes an action that they find to be at least highly questionable as a legal matter, but also deeply problematic as a moral and ethical matter, something to which they object strongly. They could resign in principle, um, but let me just suggest there are not going to be press reports about that. Um, their family and friends will know. Um, what kind of decision is that? I feel like, you know, I feel like those are personal decisions yep. that I, I think, I mean, in some ways too, it's easy to get in this moment of thinking that these are going to be your job for the next 10 or 20 years, right? Yeah. And I, I have to sort of caution us all to remember that you will all have many jobs. My parents both worked at the same place for you know, 40 years each. Not the same place, different places, but <laughs> sorry. They each stayed in their jobs for a long time. That's just not the world. And mm -hmm. so I think there are a lot of reasons people leave jobs. One may be, you, you, you know, when I was at the Department of Justice under the Bush administration, my feeling was, and by the way, I left because I got tired and I couldn't travel anymore, but my feeling was I will leave if I stop learning or if I feel that I am not able to do the work of civil rights that I believe in and came here to do. And those were my, and, and by the way, I want you guys to know, I was very explicit in my mind about those when I went in because I wanted to have a process and a framework by which I would think about what, you know, what was the escape hatch? What was that sort of parachute if I at some moment in time felt like I need to get out? I didn't have... I got tired first. Now, I'm not saying I wouldn't have come to that point at some point, who knows, but I think it's really important to, to be critical of your, to push yourself on why you're making a decision, mm -hmm. to gut check that with people you love and trust, but if you feel like you need to resign and step out of something, you will have other jobs. There will be lots of other opportunities. If you go into this administration, you may have opportunities to stay in the next one, right? There's, it's more fluid than I think sometimes we feel it is, and. By the way, we've all resigned for many jobs. We've all also been fired. I was fired by the people of the state of New Jersey. Preet was fired, my boss was. <laughs> Preet was fired by the president. Have you ever been fired? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> you're being good company. Be. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I mean, I'll check the like mail when I go back to the are. office. We'll see. <laughs> uh, this, this issue, by the way, we keep going back and forth saying a government job is different. And it is, but I, I want to come full circle on this idea that these moral questions that you ask yourself personally happen in other kinds of public interest places as well, including, yeah. for example, recently I was thinking about the ACLU. The ACLU is a great place for a lot of people to want to work who have you know, a particular view about liberty and about freedom of the press and freedom of speech and everything else. But, you know, we had this incident in Charlottesville, and what people, I think, <laughs> often have not focused on uh, at the time was, I believe this to be true, that there were lawyers at the ACLU who were, who were specifically defending legally the right of the neo-Nazis and others to march, which is a decidedly unpopular position. And it's also my understanding, and I haven't read the reports carefully, that there were some people who became upset about it who were at the mm -hmm. ACLU. And my bet is that some people threatened to resign over it, and people who wouldn't have read you know, reports about, you know, young people potentially as well, and they engaged in a change in policy. And I think for the first time ever, they now have a carve out uh, you know, pursuant to which they will not defend the free speech rights, and leave it to others, the free speech rights of people who I think carry weapons in connection with their, with their protest. And I don't know, I, it's appropriate if you're at the ACLU and they haven't made that decision that you resign from that and figure out another way you want to serve the public interest. But those kinds of decisions about whether you stay or go from an organization are not limited to the government. Very important point. We do have time for a couple of questions, and there are mics. So if you'd like to ask one, come to one of the mics. Um, or if you don't want to, I'll keep asking. All right, well, you uh, screw up your courage. Let me, um, uh, let me pose another question. So, question. Oh, we've got one, great. Or he's leaving. I could just stammer until it happens, good. Hi, sorry, so um, you mentioned briefly the importance of going, and, and that it's not just federal government that yeah. students at NYU can go in, uh, to work for. To what extent is a moment like this, um, with an administration like this, an opportunity for places like NYU to maybe divert some of the 
students who might otherwise have gone into the federal government into state and lo local government, um, as opposed to sort of waiting it out in firms. I know and that hasn't been an area that it seems like NYU focuses on. Yeah, um, I, I think it's a great question. And I do think, I mean, I, I will tell you guys, when I was at NYU many, many years ago, and I told people I was going to the Manhattan DA's office, they were like, what? You can't. Your career is ruined, right? I mean, essentially, you should go be a federal prosecutor. Now, you guys know this, but federal prosecutors are very important people who <laughs> do like 5% of all criminal cases in America. It's like nothing, right? I mean, it's, it, it priests, they're, really big. Priests, they're really big cases, but they would, the number would be a rounding error in the AG's office, right? I mean, it's just different. It's just different. And the cases are, they're different, they're more complex, they're bigger, the federal laws are really important. But there is incredible opportunity in the state. I have never had a job where I was able to say, as I was when I was in the AG's office, and it's not just at the AG level, where I would say, I want every confession to be recorded. And then the entire state of New Jersey, every law enforcement officer had to record a confession, right? I mean, there are very few examples of that direct line between being able to make policy and implement it. And in the federal government, even, you know, forget being a prosecutor for a minute. Think about being at the EPA. You're making very high level decisions. When you're at an EPA or a DEP in a state, you're literally making decisions that get implemented a week or two weeks later, and you're literally impacting people's lives. So I think the unit of the city, I think cities are the unit of the future, candidly. We talk a lot about states and counties, but I think we, are, we will become a country of cities. Um, and there's incredible political power and opportunity to, to do impactful work there, and in the states as well. And so I personally, I love that work. I think it's really important. I do want everyone to work in the federal government, of course, as well. Um, but I really love it. And I think there's such a great opportunity. Also, candidly, it's a lot, there's a lot of opportunity for great lawyers and people who are smart and hardworking to have real career trajectories in those offices and to move pretty quickly through the ranks and also to get a lot of experience. I had, I had more discretion in Manhattan than I did at DOJ. When I got to DOJ, they said, you won't believe how much bureaucracy there is here. And I was like, oh, I was in the Manhattan DA's office. I know bureaucracy. Let did me not. tell you, I did not know bureaucracy. <laughs> I did not know it. But anyway, it's a great question. And I would love to see us think a lot about you know, state and local, all types of opportunities for lawyers. Well, I couldn't agree more. Not because, um, and, and I know the, the question didn't mean it this way. I don't think it would be the law school's policy intentionally to divert anyone anywhere, but certainly to highlight opportunities. Um, and to help create ones. Um, and so, small plug, you may have heard over the summer, we've established a new center in the environmental space that's really going to entail a set of partnerships with state attorneys, uh, attorney general offices, and the, the state AGs who were here yesterday are among those we're liable to be partnering with, uh, to do uh, environmental work at the state level. And there will be opportunities for people while students to get involved in that work, so small. Plug. And after, to get hired. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, one of the career possibilities that I'm considering is becoming a ADA who prosecutes sex crimes and domestic violence specifically. Um, and for me, the personal kind of ethical tension is I'm pretty well convinced that sending perpetrators to jail is not effective and pretty well convinced it's not just either. Um, so I'm wondering if you guys have kind of you know, resolved or not resolved maybe tension with institution or system, not just policy, but kind of at, at a broader yeah. scope. Yeah, so we, we talk, I'm going to give a plug for my seminar now. Um, <laughs> it's not a podcast, but I'm teaching a seminar. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying, we, we literally have this conversation all the time, which is, it's called criminal justice innovation. And it is, look, do I believe that there are unbelievably deep flaws in the criminal justice system? I do. I don't think it is as just or as fair or as equitable as it should be. And we could have huge conversations about bias, about the negative implications of jail and prison. I mean, we, these are conversations we have in the seminar. I still believe in the rule of law. I believe that laws have to be enforced. And I believe that the questions we should be asking are, what does accountability look like? Now, sex crimes and domestic violence are very tough spaces. And you may know this, as is, domestic, as is DUI because those are offenses for which people frequently repeat and for which there is incredible danger. The one type of homicide that literally we cannot drop, right? I mean, we have trace levels of crime in New York City. We cannot eliminate or drop significantly domestic violence. In Camden, when I was AG, we cut murders by 37, by 40%. Today, there are about eight or 10. When I was AG at the beginning, there were about 60 murders. Now, there are about 10. 
those are mostly domestic violence. So the level of importance and how we treat those is, is beyond, it, you know, goes beyond even what we think about for other crimes. So we have not yet come up with other alternatives in those spaces of what accountability looks like that would keep the public safe. And so I personally, you know, I did that work my whole career. My first interview in the Manhattan DA's office was Linda Fairstein. <laughs> I was scared of her then. I went to work in sex crimes. I'm still scared of her. <laughs> See her tonight, I'm still scared of her. I love her, but she is, you know, she's one of the most amazing prosecutors. And, you know, you would just have dinner with her and you'd feel like you were interrogated. And, um, <laughs> but I learned more from her than I learned from any other prosecutor I worked for. So we should talk about this, but I think, you know, we don't have the option of opting out. To me, and I'll tell you one very quick story. When I became AG, Camden was the second most dangerous city in America. It had been on that list either as the most dangerous city or the second most dangerous city for about 10 years. Another AG had taken it over and then he left. And so day one, I'm 36 years old, I've been a criminal prosecutor, I'm in charge of one of the most dangerous cities on the planet. And I go to Camden and I don't see a single police car for four hours, not a single police car. And that night there's murders. Five days later, a 12 year old is shot and killed. And I literally start going to Camden every single day because I personally feel, which is I think some of the government responsibility, this is my responsibility to try to make this city safe. And the number one thing was public safety. Number two was equity and fairness and being treated with respect, all of which I would argue are equal in many ways, but number one is public safety, at least in my book. And so I very much believe in criminal prosecution. I very much believe that people should be criminal prosecutors. You get the discretion to decide which cases you bring and which cases you don't. But all of my work right now and my innovation work is committed to reforming the system, to keeping people out who don't need to be in. And so I don't think they feel inconsistent. I don't think they are. So if you take my class, <laughs> it's just, it's not apple.com, but it's NY, nyulaw.com. Apple, pod, apple podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy Slash to talk free. more. <laughs> uh, so this has been terrific. As, as promised, I don't think we've um, arrived at conclusive answers to these hard questions. Um, if we've given some uh, help and, and suggestions in how you might organize your thinking about these hard questions, then I think we'll count this session a real success. These are, so some of the messages I've heard here include uh, that speaking just at the level of government lawyer is far too high a level of generality. Um, that you want to think about the particular context, the particular role. Might be level of government, might be job within the government, whether it's working for an elected official, working in a prosecutor office, working in an office that's defending the government civilly, working in an office that's advancing legal policy and the like. Um, then there's also a set of questions about uh, the role of a lawyer and the level of comfort or discomfort one should have if there's a space between what the client is doing and what you think is right. And some of that tension might be inevitable in any lawyerly role, but then there are special considerations when your client is the United States. Um, and last is conscience, right? That every one of you, of course, every one of us, uh, needs to consult our own conscience um, and needs to recognize that that's a legitimate source <laughs> of decision-making guidance, uh, whether you're the Attorney General of New Jersey, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, or just starting out in your careers. Uh, and to balance that against the idea that the premise of government service is not that everyone who agrees comes over here and joins the team, but the government service transcends administration. And the question is how each one of us will strike the balance then, I think, between those goals and where we sit individually with our own values. We can't answer those questions barely for ourselves, let alone for you. But hopefully you found this session interesting. I certainly have. I now have a class to sign up for and a podcast to listen to. So join me in thanking these two speakers.